Welcome to the Unfiltered Show from the Score Studios in Toronto. My name is Joseph Cacharo. That's Tyler McKillop. And joining us remotely today, eight-year NBA <laughs> veteran, 2012 lottery pick, two-time ACC Defensive Player of the Year, John Henson. John, welcome to the show. Fellas, how you doing? I, I, I wanted to, I didn't know you guys were in Toronto, but look, anytime you guys want me in studio, just let me know. <laughs> oh, what? Favorite places. Yeah, we're, we're more than happy. <laughs> I mean, like I was telling you before, uh, before you came on air here, we were having the most Canadian conversation ever before you came in about a coworker who once hit a moose. So yes, we are very much in the great white north Perfect. up here, but ready to talk all things ball with you. Uh, like I said, we appreciate you taking the time. You're officially sure. our first ho- uh, first guest uh, and the first pro that we've had in our long three-episode yeah. history <laughs> here at the Unfiltered Show, so we appreciate you, man. Hopefully it's the start of a good thing, man. I appreciate you having me. Yes, sir. Okay, let's get right into it, guys. Um, The East Final is officially over, and what I want to know is this. John, we can start with you because of your experience in the league, obviously, but when a team is as big an underdog as the Pacers were in this series, and then especially as big an underdog as they were in games three and four without Tyrese Halliburton, is it fair for us to criticize them for, you know, quote-unquote choking or blowing it in three of the four games? Because here are the numbers. Game one, they blew a five-point lead in the final two minutes. Game two, they blew an eight-point lead in the final three minutes. And then game four, an eight-point lead in the final six minutes. So, again, do you see that as some sort of failure or choking on Indiana's part? Or was the fact they were even in three of the four games in this series kind of a victory in itself? Yeah, I think it's actually more of a case on kind of Boston not really yeah. doing what they needed to do to put a team away. I think in the last 10 minutes combined for the games three and four, Boston was only up for 38 seconds. Wow. So we can say what we want. Indiana should have at least stolen one of those games, the buzzer beater, the turnovers. And, I mean, it's just experience. You saw the Celtics' experience down the stretch guys that have been in the finals, guys that have played at the highest level, and they just kind of walked them down, man. And and when you look up at the score, Celtics are up two, up three, game over. Uh, and that's how good Boston is. Also, Indiana will learn from this. But it was just an experience thing, man. Indiana really was supposed to at least have two games. And Boston will give you a game, as we know. Yeah. Yeah. Boston will give you one. So Indiana didn't get one, and uh, credit to Boston for, for you know, staying steady and, and not panicking and they hit some big shots well i i said to you about game three i said they they you basically gave them game three there were eight two 18 point second half leads that the pacers had in game three that was definitely a game to have and i said to you as well even missing halliburton and even with halliburton i do feel like this team is still missing those like those gotta have it shot makers in those final few minutes like that was the big absent point that i felt like just running out of gas in the final few minutes of uh, definitely the two games in Indiana because you get yeah. the home crowd as well. You kind of get your best opportunity to steal one or two. Um, but I mean, do we need to keep watching this series? For another, <laughs> did we need another one? I, don't, I feel like no, we didn't need another one. No, I hear you. I think the Pacers like should be lauded on some level for putting up a fight, for especially sure. in the two games mm-hmm. without Halliburton. I think a lot of teams would have folded in that. Okay, so like I, they deserve some credit for putting up a fight. But I also think like, man, this is the Eastern Conference Finals. You know, you could give me, heck, give me a non-playoff team. On a re- like, and give them three leads like Indiana had in crunch time, even against the Celtics. And I feel like they get one, you know, like to not even get one is just kind of, it's like a deflating way for an otherwise really good, fun, inspiring yeah. season. It's just kind of a shame that it ended in that fashion, um, but it did. And John, you touched on the fact that maybe it says more about the Celtics, right? And like yeah. them not putting a team away. You mentioned how, you know, they're liable to give a team one, like they'll let you get one. And this is kind of where I want to go next. So I think that's a good segue because the Celtics just wrapped up a 12-2 and run through the Eastern Conference playoffs. And that's after a 64-win season where they finished 14 games ahead of second place in the East. They became just the fifth team this century to finish seven games clear atop the overall standings. They posted the fifth best point differential ever. They are the 10th team in history to finish top two in both offensive and defensive rating. And yet... Like, they're cruising into the finals with an overall 76-20 and 20 record. But am I wrong to say that they're somehow uninspiring or, like, underwhelming? So, like, you know, I, down, you know, I was down here where I'm from, from in Florida, right? Canada, different slang, but we call that, they play with their food. <laughs> they, they, they don't lock in sometimes. 
they're so talented that they can go with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in the fourth and get rescued. You throw Derek White in there, and then you throw Al Horford hitting seven threes. Now you have a sweep, right? So that's the only thing that worries me about this Celtics team. Then again, you know, Jason Tatum has been to the playoffs, what, five out of the six years, three conference. I mean, he's he's done so much. Don't want to say he's bored, but I think that the Celtics kind of were lulled to sleep a little bit with this playoffs. The, the, the Pacers didn't really get them excited. They beat the Pacers really not playing the best. So I think in the finals, they're going to lock in. Tatum said last year, the worst thing they ever did was let me get there. Now I know what I need to do. So this year should be the year. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be favored to win no matter what. Um, so we'll see if they play with their food in the finals because if, if they do that, Luke and Kyrie, yeah. they'll, they'll oh. be down quickly. Yeah, <laughs> they will not allow themselves to be food. Yeah. Yes. I got I got to exactly. ask you. I got to ask you on that point because you said it, and I think we always think it, uh, or we've been thinking it throughout this this postseason. Do those guys in that room really have that feeling of these opponents aren't getting us up and getting us excited in terms of, you know, getting our best mental headspace night in and night out? Is that truly what goes on in that locker room, or has gone on for the last few weeks? I think as a team, right, you know what teams you struggle with, you know what teams that are <laughs> right. really good. Like back of your mind, and I don't think they, I don't think they feared the Pacers. I don't think they were scared of the Pacers. I think game one, what happened to them game one was probably the worst thing that could have happened for the Pacers, right? Like, <laughs> like they they got a spook, and and I'm sure Missoula went to the locker room and was like, okay, see guys, we can lose, right? And um, that kind of turned them up a little bit, and and as you saw, they they ended up sweeping a team that you thought at least we were getting one or two, uh, just. I mean, if you would have watched the game for the last five minutes, you would have thought the Pacers were up two two games of one, three games of one. Yeah. I, one other thing, because I, I found this constant. It has been a constant in this postseason, too. Is there anything that changes from a mental standpoint in a big way from a locker room when you miss that top guy? Like, the Pacers got such a great game three from that, from that group in the— lo- in the loss, of course, but we've seen it from other teams with Butler going out at one point when Giannis was out for game one. Mitchell the stole, for the Cavs. Mitchell, they still played pushed super Boston. well in that game. What changes from those guys when they know they're going to be missing? Because I know we get told, you know, this guy's a game time decision, but I'm sure everyone in that locker room knows that isn't truly the case. What changes yep. from those guys in the lead up? Well, for one, there's getting more shots. So it's a lot <laughs> yeah. more energy. You know what I mean? It's, if, if Donovan Mitchell's out, I remember when Giannis would be out, we would play. Now, we would play well for a little bit, but long-term, we needed them. Right, um, yeah. I, the ball moves different. The ball pops different. And also, the other team's not prepared, right? All your film is on uh, uh, offense based off your star player. So, Boston, no matter what you say, couldn't really prepare for Pacers. They didn't know Nimhart was going to be the guy, right? They didn't know that. So, they kind of had to adjust on the fly. And at that point in time, Indiana had the upper hand as far as film and preparation. So right. that's what happens. Game or two, you kind of fight. But at the end of the day, long term, Halliburton needed to be there for them to be successful. Unfortunately, they couldn't get over the top for him to get uh, healthy. But uh, it's definitely a different feel when you don't have your star. But it's fun for a couple games. Then all of a sudden, you're like, okay, we, we need Giannis. We, we probably should try to we, – we're not as yeah. good with him. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the Celtics ended up finishing the, the East playoffs 12-2, and two, but again, they were pushed multiple games by the yeah. Butlerless Heat, the Mitchellless Cavs, and the Hollis Pacers. Um, I don't know what to make of that. I feel like, John, you kind of hit on it. You guys both did in terms of maybe they just didn't, couldn't get themselves quite up for these it's teams crazy. the way they it's will crazy. for a Dallas or if Minnesota makes history of Minnesota in the finals, um, and of course just for the finals themselves. But we'll, we'll see whether they rise to the level of their competition mm-hmm. um, or if their foot's been off the gas too long because that's like – I feel like that could be a thing too, right? Like it's been, yeah. what, like five or six weeks now since they've been kind of, and even then they had, like I said, they finished 14 games up in the East standings. I don't even know when the last time they've really had to go like pedal to the metal is. Yeah, you're right. And I, I, I treat this, I mean, they haven't won like the Warriors, but remember when the Warriors were kind of rolling through guys and they had to yep. go seven games with the Clippers and Rockets and like Clay Thompson, game six Clay. Like the Warriors were on the ropes a few times and I don't think it was because of the lack of talent. I think they were just like, okay, we've been here before. Even when I went to Cleveland, when I got traded to Cleveland, LeBron had left to the Lakers. The energy in that building was like, 
whew, okay, we finally get to go home and have a summer. They had been to the finals like four straight <laughs> yeah. years. And so that just tends to happen with teams that have been playing for long periods of time. They kind of – Denver. Yeah, I think yeah. Denver just – they they were a little tired. They got a little bored. They weren't as motivated. And all of a sudden, boom, now you're looking at looking up in Minnesota's a game of seven up, you know, it's over. So yeah. Boston is not good enough to turn it on and off. So from game one, they have to start. You wonder how this eight-day layoff or whatever is going to affect everybody. Um, but you can't turn it on and off, not in the finals. They're not that good yet. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned what you did there because I remember so 2018 when the Warriors swept the Cavs, the last of the mm. the four straight finals between Cleveland and Golden State. Yep. I was there in Cleveland covering the finals for the score, and I got to talk to Steve Kerr after the Warriors won it in the aftermath of the champagne celebration. And he said something that like has stuck with me a long time, and you just kind of touched on it, John, but he said like when you're that good and you're expected to win and you've been there so often, he's like, obviously they're happy they won, but it's a different kind of like, it's not the same celebration. He's like, it's almost more relief than, than yes. true like euphoria and celebration, right? Because it's almost like, okay, we got the job done. It's like, and maybe the Celtics, even though they haven't actually won a title yet, at least yeah. through the East playoffs, maybe they were dealing with a little bit of that. Yeah, and I liken this too when the Bucks won a championship. I remember watching them play the next year, and you know, those were my really good friends. I played there a long time, Chris Middleton specifically. And I texted them, I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? I'm like, y'all okay? Y'all don't look the same. And now that pressure also, right? That pressure weighs on you. You're expected to win, expectations. Let's run it back. And you're sitting there like, whoo, I just got home. Like, I just got able to kick my feet up. Now I'm back, and we're expected to win every game. So um, that's just part of the grind. That's why the teams, the great teams win. And uh, I think that's the next step for the Celtics to win a championship because they keep getting there. Uh, they're, they'll eventually break through. Um, okay, moving out west now. This series is also 3 nothing. Dallas has a chance to finish the job tonight. Um, and this is where we want your you know, expertise and your yeah. knowledge as a guy who's been on NBA teams, been in a locker room, yeah. because it's easy for us to say, oh, this team's down 3 nothing. They're going to fold or they're not going to fold whatever. But from your perspective because you have been in this situation before you were on the 2013 bucks and you guys faced a three nothing series deficit to the heat now i do understand very different situation you guys were an eight seed playing the big three era heat kind of at the height of their power so i get that maybe it's a little different like minnesota should probably have a little more faith maybe tonight than uh, you know how your team did back then but i want to know what is it really like inside of a team inside a locker room down three nothing like is there genuine belief is the team actually sitting there saying, we can do it. We could be the first team in history to do this. Or are there maybe some guys who are starting to tune out the coaching and the game plan for that night? Are there some guys who are maybe already looking forward to their vacations? What, what's your memory and perspective of it? So I've been down 3-0 twice, and it's two different scenarios. My rookie year, we played the Heat. Now, when we went down 3-0 to LeBron and Bosh and Wade, it's a little different energy. Now, we were kind of <laughs> like, hey, look, we got a chance, but everyone knew it was a wrap. This is, I mean, the, they they had just won, right? They were they were running through the league. Yeah. Um, we were in trouble. Um, <laughs> we had a belief, but it was different. Now, when I was down 3-0 to the Bulls, we were a six seed. They were a three seed. We were a younger team. We knew we were going to be together. So our belief was just like, look, man, like the competitive spirit in you is like, look, someone's got to do it. Why not us, right? You got pride as well. That that word gets thrown around NBA locker rooms where you're down 3-0. And um, one game at a time. We beat them at home on a buzzer beater, 3-1. We went to their place, beat them 3-2. And I think the best feeling for us was when we, were, when we had won two games, we saw, like, the Bulls as D-Rolls and Joe Kimnoa. They were a little spooked. They were a little, they were a little spooked. And that, that was a good feeling. We ended up losing about 40 uh, against six. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, um, it was fun to rattle their cage a little bit. And, and and we had hope, man. Like, we were like, look, if we win this game at home, we go back for game seven. So you're just thinking about one game at a time. And uh, that's how we played it on my year with the Bulls. Now with the Heat, they they sent us packing very quickly. So yeah. it, was a, it was a different dynamic. Was that series – because, okay, I remember um, there was one series, and I think it was Milwaukee-Miami, where going into the series, Brandon Jennings – might have said something yes. like Bucks. Did you say Bucks and four or Bucks and six or something? So, 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 so BJ said Bucks and six. And, you know, I, 
some of the older guys on the team, I remember being a little bit upset because why would you give the first and I mean best big three, right? Like think about that motivation, right? Like yeah. Bucks and six. We had just beat them by twenty. So he comes out and says, you know, we like our Miami matchup. And we were just like, oh, my God. But we love this confidence. That was our point guard. That was our leader. But, like, we kind of have a rule in the NBA, right? Like, you don't poke the bear if you're going to yeah. guard, if you let your guard in the bear. So, you know, guys talking mess to LeBron, if you're not going to guard him, leave that man alone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, don't, don't, we, don't, don't set him up to come at me because you're talking. <laughs> so, um, they came out with a focus and energy that I, I I was a rookie, so I was sitting there like, I mean, you remember when the Heat they had the, the Heat behind the goal and they was playing the songs and LeBron yeah. standing in the middle of the court with the cheerleaders, like yeah. it was a whole different ball game, man. And uh, yeah. we gave them a little motivation, the motivation they didn't need, and uh, they sent us home. <laughs> I gotta I gotta ask. This is for both of you, and even I I was thinking about this, this this whole morning. Is what do you think the difference is from the NBA? Obviously, we've seen 3-0 deficits overcome in baseball and in hockey, and we still haven't seen it in the NBA. What is it that makes the league so different or that the matchup so different from those other sports and being able to overcome it? I'm I'm kind of thinking it's the NBA is more of a you know percentages game, like water finds its level, but you could also say the same about baseball. I mean, I mean I'll, I, I'll give you my theory, and then John can tell me whether I'm right or wrong, but uh, my theory is that like the nature of basketball, like the game itself, if you compare, okay, like hockey, the best players are on the ice 20 to 25 out of mm-hmm. 60 minutes, and how much of that Great time point. is the puck actually on their stick? Yep. Baseball, you know, even Shohei Otani, who pitches and hits, who's like a once-in-a-generation athlete, he's still only one out of nine guys hitting, and he's pitching once every five days. In basketball, the best play, like if you have a talent advantage in basketball, that means like your best players especially in the playoffs, you're on the court 40 to 42 out of 48 minutes and the ball is in their hands yeah. the majority of the game. So that's the way I've always seen it. It's like, it's just a lot harder to overcome that talent disadvantage, especially when you have to come down from three, nothing as opposed to some of those other games where, you know, maybe a little more lo- like hockey, there's a goalie, there's a little more variance and luck. And that yeah. like, that's always been my theory, John. I don't know. You know, if you there's agree or you have, I, I, I agree. Go ahead. I was saying, go ahead. Dude. Oh, I was just saying there's nothing fluky in those sports about, about yeah. or in the NBA about a 3-0 lead. There could be in the other yeah. ones. Yeah, NBA, basketball is a funny thing, man. It, I don't care if you line Shaq, Jordan, all those guys <laughs> up, right? They're not going to win 82 games. That's just not how it goes. There's going to be bad games. You're going to have a game where you don't shoot it well. That's just how basketball goes. So – if you're down 3-0, you have to beat this team four straight times at home, away. It is just tough. It's just so tough to do it in, in basketball. And like you said, the best players have the ball at all times. And on some teams, right, like Luka and Kyrie can legit win a game for you. I don't care who's in front of you. Jason Tatum, doesn't matter. So that's why it's so tough because – it gets to a point where now we're like Luca and Kyrie may say, okay, well shoot, it's three, two, you're up three, zero. Like let's go get this one. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, that, that's, I think the biggest difference from other sports, right? Like you said, there's less time with the star players, but basketball it's like, okay, well we're going to get the ball to Luca, take us home. Yeah. And that's, yeah. you don't see that in a lot of sports. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a good point. I think uh, it's funny though, because Ant said that he still, you know, he, he still didn't think what did he say? I don't. I still don't think they can beat us. Even though they're yeah, well, I mean, you got to admire. I mean, that's Ant, right? Like you got to admire the the bravado there. Yeah. But yeah, with, with respect, no, I, I was oh, gonna say like go, Ant, go ahead, Ant, John. Yeah, I was saying Ant, like first time doing this, like you know, some of the things he's saying. Love Ant, like we love him to death. But like, like you say, you don't need to give anybody any bullets and board yeah, material. Yeah, he loves to do it, and you don't need to tell the other team that you're going to shoot the ball yeah. a lot. Yeah. Why would like? Why are you divulging strategy, right? Like, yeah. the Mavs heard that and said, "Okay, well, look, we're gonna double team him, and yeah, sure, he can shoot all the balls. Like, we're gonna play towards that." And, and he was not as efficient. He didn't score. I mean, he scored, but it wasn't like he went off and won the game. So, yeah, no. yeah, Anthony, keep your strategy to yourself, <laughs> and then do it on the court. He did yeah. do it. He would he take twenty three <laughs> shots in game yeah. three? Yeah. He said he was guarding Kyrie. Like, okay, Mavs are like, okay, well, Ant's guarding Kyrie. Let's write that down. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah. Le- yeah, the strategy needs to stay in in house. Yeah, and that's probably honestly a part of why he looks so gassed in this series is he's trying to guard Kyrie the whole time, and that's just one of many reasons probably why the Wolves are down three nothing. I know every game has been competitive, so I don't want to make it seem like they're getting run off the floor, but they are down three nothing. And they were the favorite in this series, right? With home court advantage. So I think there's plenty of blame to go around. And yet, I think in very predictable fashion, the guy who's taken the majority of that blame is Rudy Gobert. And like, I don't, I don't want to over defend him. We have, uh, we have a young buck here. His name's Brian. He usually works in the studio. He's not here today. <laughs> he is a big Rudy Gobert hater. He would be so mad if I defend him. But So I don't want to over-defend him. Like, even the play everyone talked about, end of Game 3, the Luka Doncic game winner, I get that there, you know, he has to take some of the criticism. Even maybe he could have been more aggressive and forced Luka inside and you give up a 2 as opposed to the step-back 3 everyone in the world knew he wanted. Like, I get he deserves some of the blame. But at the end of the day, like, and John, you tweeted this actually after Game 3. Like, you said um, uh, that them switching... Gobert onto Luka when a non-shooter in Lively set the screen was absolutely insane. Jaden McDaniel yeah. said later on that he wanted the matchup, but they were supposed to switch it. That's what Coach Finch wanted. Like, isn't this more of an indictment on um, a coaching decision or a team scheme decision than it is an indictment of, Ru- of Rudy Gobert as a defender or like an indictment of his Defensive Player of the Year candidacy? Yeah, you know, and that's just part of the playoff experience. If Rudy Gobert is on the Warriors, if Rudy Gobert is on the LeBron Cavs, if Rudy Gobert is on the Denver Nuggets, Jamal Murray is saying, screw what the coach is saying, I'm getting the ball out of Lucas' hands. Right. And and that's just, that's veteran, that's just what happens. Jaden McDaniels should have just stayed on him and said, Rudy, either get out or get the ball out of his hands. Now, you got to listen to your coach, but there's a reason the best teams are their own coach. That's the reason that Draymond Green is so revered and respected. Like, he is a coach on the court, right? Steve Nash was a coach on the court. Jason Kidd's a coach on the court. So that right there, yeah, someone got to say, hey, coach, we ain't, ro- we ain't rocking with that. I'm going to get him. And 100 times out of 100 times, all NBA coaches would be like, man, listen, if that's what you guys want to do, I am, I am down, right? And with Rudy Gobert – I think he was trying to make him drive, but he's just speak just too yeah. slow. Like he, Luca was set. Like you say, the whole world knew. Luca, <laughs> you're, you're up two zero. Why not? Right? Yeah. Well, why not? But in reference to Rudy Gobert, he leads the playoffs in plus minus, highest of any player. Hated or loved, he's the first ballot Hall of Famer, right? Yeah. right? And he has the highest true shooting percentage in the history of the NBA. <laughs> he's had a couple of bad plays. He's seven five, guys. Like he's not supposed to be sliding a perimeter, standing in front of. I'm sorry. No, yeah. listen. It's guys that are smaller, bigger, taller, faster that can't stand in front of Lucas. So yeah, we harp on Rudy because he's making so much money. But you know what? He led the best, one of the best defenses ever in history. Anchored them this year. Won his fourth defensive player of the year. Give him his flowers. Leave the man alone. I'm a defensive guy. That's how I'm in my living. So right, I love some Rudy Gobert. Yeah, like we said we, when we introduced you, two-time ACC Defensive Player of the Year. I, sure. I figured you would be Team Rudy on this because, yeah, my thing is, like, again, I'm not saying Rudy Gobert is perfect. He makes mistakes. And, yeah, mm-hmm. he's not the most mobile big man. So it's tough when he switches or if he has to guard in space on the perimeter. But, like, there are very few perfect players in the NBA, right? Even in the NBA, very few perfect players. Even among great defensive players, there's few perfect defensive players. And you have to, as a team, like when I had to guard Joel Embiid, my team knew it was a mismatch. They right. helped, right? Minnesota left him on the island. I don't care what you say. You left them on the island with one of the few guys you don't want to be on the island with. They didn't dig. There was no – like they let him go one-on-one, mano y mano. And Lucas is going to do that to the majority of people in general. So that was a schematic team mistake because yeah. – if that happens again tonight, you think Jaden McDaniels is going to just run into the lane with Derek Lively or one of their big men? Like, nah, he's going to stay. He's just going to tell Rudy to get out. I would love, I would have lived with Derek Lively coming down the lane, having to make a decision, make right. a play for the game. We, we live in that all yeah. every day. Yeah. And uh, still, you, you don't lose. You're tied up. You have a chance. Yeah. And, and I think that's why 
like even the and I know Draymond has a history with Rudy and that's the root of all this. Oh, but Dre like that's my guy. He's on him. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that's why I was like disappointed in Draymond for this. Only because like I Draymond from like a basketball IQ perspective is one of the smartest guys in the league. Like mm. a brilliant basketball mind. And I feel like even all the stuff you just talked about, like Draymond definitely knows that. You know, like he knows that that's not fully on Rudy, but he kind of led the chorus of guys being like, this is on Rudy. Like, this is why he's not defense player of the year. This is why they lost when it's like, you know, as we talked about, Ant is having a really bad series offensively. He's, I, I think the first two rounds of the playoffs, he had shown this like really advanced playmaking prowess. And I was like, wow, mm-hmm. this is like stuff. Guys usually have to fail in the playoffs for years to acquire this stuff. And he's got it already. I think you're kind of seeing it now. We're like, okay, he's a little hesitant facing a double or he's, you know, a little indecisive. And then Cat, self-proclaimed greatest big, uh, greatest shooting big man ever, okay. is, you know, having a shooting slump that, you know, I don't remember Dirk. Listen, Dirk had a couple bad, memorably bad playoff series, but I don't ever remember him shooting it like this in a playoff series. Yeah. There was a stat, uh, ESPN Stats and Info put it out. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns right now, the fourth worst field goal percentage by any player through the first three games of a conference or divisional finals in the shot clock era. Oh and the yeah. worst three-point percentage over a five-game span among players with 30 or more three-point I was going to say, it goes back to game like NBA six. History. It's not yeah. even just this series. Yeah. Sorry, Joe, what were you going to say? No, it's, it's hard. Like, the playoffs are hard, man. Like, yeah. I feel like Carl Towns, even Ant, like, it's easy to shoot a swing screen three. Carl Towns, it's easy to shoot a 18-foot one-leg fade. It's easy to drive to the lane and throw up some hooks or something. Like, that's easy to do. They're going to give – it's the playoffs. They're going to give you these tough shots and live with it. So for Towns, it's just about being more efficient and being more, you know, demonstrative in your shot selection, right? If you're struggling down the stretch, get to the basket, play through other players, get, you know, but he'll learn that. Like, this is his first really playoff run in 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Like, I was playing against the Heat in the first round my first year. So, like, He's just got to learn, man. You don't just because like you don't settle, right? Take yeah. a good shot, but like he's just—I mean, he's putting a shot. He just—he just shooting it. Like you can't—you can't play like that in the playoffs, or you will be down three zero. Yeah, the uh, I've—I was even having the thought, so I, I looked into it just of since those those Cavs Warriors days. You know, no team that's that's beaten the defending champ has gone on to to win the title. I don't even know if any of them have gone to play. Maybe the Celtics were the one that's played in the title game. I do find that. You have this feeling of relief when you take down, you know, the team to beat in the postseason and maybe let your foot off the gas a little bit or maybe run out a bit of energy for sure, which I'm seeing from this this T-Wolves team, especially I think a little bit defensively. Um, I do think that tonight they could, just from oh, that- purely the shooting percentages standpoint of just finding its level, they could get one tonight, but... Yeah, then they go back to Minnesota. So, like, again, they you know, all three games have been competitive. If they can get one, and so you go back to game five yeah. in Minnesota, I don't think it's, you know, crazy to think we can maybe be talking about a game six here. But um, obviously a long way to go. John, do you kind of agree with that? Is there maybe if a team takes down the defending champs the way the Timberwolves did in, like, a really emotional, exhausting, long, grueling series – even just beyond the physical exhaustion, is there maybe like an emotional letdown after that to be able to kind of get yourself back up for the next series within 48 hours? Yeah, I mean, let's let's look at all the quotes. Let's look at everything that's being said. The Wolves are feeling themselves, right? Like yeah. Like Edwards is hanging out, laughing, Carl Towns is joking around. We've been losing for 10. Like, wow, the Mavericks are like, we, we job's not done. We, we've got another series. We've got a great team coming in. And... I think that's came back to bite them in the butt because now they're down 3-0 and now all of a sudden it's like, what happened, right? Like, everybody thought Minnesota was going to the finals. I mean, come on, nobody thought this was going to be, you know, Dallas be up 3-0. Yeah. So, yeah. I think they got to be able to handle prosperity, but yeah, they got excited. They're like, oh my God, we beat the champs. We've never been here before. Like, yay! And, and now <laughs> Dallas is about to send you to Cancun and you're going to have to try again next year, you know? So, it's <laughs> it's tough, but uh. They'll learn from this, and uh, they'll be better for it. Uh, Just before we get out of here, I know the finals matchup hasn't officially been set. I don't want to disrespect Minnesota too much by, you know, counting (laughs) them out already. But I think it's, like, pretty safe to say we're going to get a Mm -hmm. Boston-Dallas final. So before we let you go, John, just uh, your thoughts on a potential Celtics-Mavs matchup. Um, Do you think that 
the Celtics switchability and that kind of insane versatility they have on defense, do you think that's finally the match for Kyrie and Luka and that they'll kind of finally run into trouble in that series? Or do you think there's something about this new look post-deadline Mavs team um, with Gafford and Washington and if Lively's healthy and stuff uh, that can trouble the Celtics in ways that even the first three teams in the East couldn't? Now, the Celtics beat them twice with Luka, and then the last time they beat them about 28 with P.J. Washington in the starting lineup. So that's something that kind of raises your eyebrow. Um, but it's going to be tough for the Mavs. You could throw Tatum on them. You could throw Brown on them. You can give and give White a chance. you got Drew Holiday who can switch. If they get Porzingis, that even adds more versatility to their lineup. They can go big. And the reason why the Mavs are so good right now is because they're putting – the Minnesota Timbers on a disadvantage. They have the most lobs since 2001. I don't think they're going to get that against Boston. So it's going to be interesting to see how they play without getting those lobs at the rim because I think their boss is going to try to start switching off one through five and just stay in help. And uh, that's what they did the last two times when they beat them uh, pretty good. So uh, Mavs going to have their hands full. And Boston's been there before. They got that, that, that sour taste of being up 2-1 against the Warriors and letting the – Old Warriors beat them. Yep. So uh it's gonna be a hell of a hell of a hell of a series. But I, I think Boston is it's 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 destined, man. They've been there so many times. Tatum's been in won so many playoff games. It's it's about that time. Yeah, it, it feels like that. Even though for all we said about like this underwhelming quote unquote run twelve and two run through the East, it does feel like they just kind of they know um, what the business at hand is. And even when, like, Horford is so hungry for that first ring. And I know he's not the star on the team, but, like, yeah. they've they're, they've got some hungry young guys, hungry vets. I, I think it's their year. And, and, and Boston, I mean, they, Boston literally wakes up with a 10-and-a-half spread. Like, they're that good. Like, <laughs> yeah. they, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we, like no matter what they're, like, like seven and a half plus, like, yeah. if, if I ever see Boston under four and a half, three and a half, like, that'll be a day, right? Like, yeah. when the last time we've seen that? So they're, they're that good. Yeah. yeah, I wonder what it'll be on the road in, in Dallas. It like might for be games at three the, and four or something. that four and a half area. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. they will still be favorites even oh, on yeah. the road in that yeah. series. Three like and they, a half even? they had that statistically dominant of a season, like I was kind of reading yeah. off earlier. And uh, we'll see if they can finish the job. Anyway, John, thanks so much for your time, man. We appreciate it. Like I said, we're very happy yeah. to have you as our first guest. So hope you enjoyed it too. Appreciate you guys, man. Thank you. All right, for Tyler McKillop. I'm Joseph Cacharo. This has been The Unfiltered Show. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.